one of the greatest disasters in maritime history, claimed the lives of over 1,500 passengers. This is the telling of the story of Maine's connections to the legendary Titanic and the lives of four men of Maine. When Titanic embarked on her near 3,000-mile journey, two men from Brunswick sailed in first-class accommodations. These two men were Percival White and his son Richard. Percival was a textile manufacturer, originally from Winchenden, Massachusetts, who had made his fortune in denim manufacturing. Percival had married Edith Wheeler, whose family all hailed from the Topsom and Brunswick area. Edith preferred to live in Brunswick, and when her youngest son Richard was accepted to Bowdoin College for the fall of 1909, Edith had a house built on the edge of the Bowdoin College campus at a place she named The Pines. Richard had worked hard at Bowdoin, and he became a member of the Delta Kappa Epsilon fraternity. By December of 1911, Richard had finished his degree studies a full semester early. To celebrate his son's grand accomplishment, Percival took his son on a trip to Europe. On March 23rd of 1912, Percival and Richard boarded the RMS Olympic at Pier 59 in New York, bound for Southampton, England. Just five days later, on March 28th, the RMS Olympic docked in Southampton. The two men then spent the next two weeks traveling and seeing the sights. Both Percival and Richard spent time perusing the shops of Old England and France. Although Percival had planned to make their return trip on the RMS Olympic, Percival liked to book travel on ships that were making their maiden voyages. When Percival learned that the maiden voyage of the RMS Titanic was suddenly moved ahead, he quickly changed plans and booked passage on the RMS Titanic. On April 10th of 1912, the newest White Star Line cruise ship, the RMS Titanic, was ready to leave the docks at Southampton, England, to begin her maiden voyage to America. Of the 2,229 souls on board Titanic, 300 were American. And of those 300 Americans were many who had connections to Maine, either as summer residents, summer visitors, or vacationers. On Wednesday, April 10th, at exactly 12 noon, the RMS Titanic cast off all lines and engaged her engines and pulled away from the dock at Southampton. The suction caused by the huge triple-screw propellers of Titanic had caused the SS New York to pull away from the dock. Her lines snapped and her stern swung into the channel. The SS New York began drifting into the path of Titanic's propellers. Only quick action narrowly averted a dockside disaster. 
Percival and his son were booked into first class cabin number D26 on the saloon deck. where they placed their luggage and then hurried to the side rail of the ship to wave goodbye to England. From Southampton, the Titanic then sailed to Cherbourg, France and entered the harbor there at 6.35 p.m. that evening. There, Elizabeth Lines and her daughter Mary boarded the RMS Titanic. The Lines ladies occupied cabin D-28, adjacent to the White's cabin. 30 a.m. on April 11th. 63 men and 60 women boarded the ship at Queenstown but seven passengers had gotten off. By 1.30 p.m., Titanic lifted her anchor and departed Queenstown for the final leg of her voyage and set out to sea. It was the last time Titanic's passengers would see land. Since their cabins were adjacent, the white men and the lion's ladies were designated table mates in the dining room. The whites' and the lion's got to know one another. Percival and Elizabeth became fast friends, as did the younger Ma Richard and Mary, while Brunswick's Percival and Richard White were settling in and getting to know their neighbors. Another of Maine's families were also settling into their cabins on board Titanic. John Thayer and his wife Marion were wealthy socialites whose fortunes were made through railroads, and they were frequent summer residents at Maine's Bar Harbor, and their 17-year-old son Jack accompanied them on this trip to Europe, as did their maid, Margaret Fleming. As Titanic sailed further from land, John and Marion, along with their maid Margaret Fleming, all settled into their C-68 cabin on the sea deck, while Jack stayed in the adjacent cabin of C-70. Although there is nothing to suggest the Thayers and Whites had known each other, their time on board Titanic would likely have had similar activities. As the next few days progressed, the white men and the lion's women had become friends, while Percival and Elizabeth enjoyed walks on deck, taking in the air and conversing. Richard and Mary enjoyed games of whist and fun chats, and Richard is said to have played his mandolin while he entertained his young female companion with songs from Bowdoin College. The nights were filled with music played by the Titanic band. Dancing and more games were enjoyed, and the bonds of friendship had been sewed. By Sunday, April 14th, Titanic had sailed over 2,500 miles since leaving Queenstown, and New York was just another 1,000 miles away. It had been four days since Titanic set sail from Southampton, and there were only three days left in the voyage. By that evening, the foursome met up in the first-class dining room located on D-Deck. The seven-course meal included the choice of roast duck, filet mignon, lamb, or salmon with all the trimmings. Dessert offered a choice of peaches, ice cream, eclairs, and Waldorf pudding. After dinner, 
The whites and the lineses took a stroll on deck for fresh air and conversation. The air was fresh but cold. It began nearly two hours earlier. Percival begged Richard to remain close. Now, with Titanic's bow lowering deeper into the sea, Percival and Richard then joined hands and leapt together into the frigid ocean. More than 1,500 lives went into the sea when Titanic slipped below the surface of the ocean. Jack had swum to an overturned collapsible lifeboat. His father, John Thayer, and Richard's father, Percival White, were never seen again. And the fate of Richard White was yet unknown. By approximately 3.30 on the morning of April 15th of 1912, the RMS Carpathia had finally arrived at Titanic's last known location. Titanic was gone, but just over 700 survivors were plucked from the lifeboats and brought up onto the deck of Carpathia. Carpathia had also recovered four bodies, all of whom were then properly buried at sea. By nearly 9 a.m., just more than six and a half hours after Titanic had disappeared, the RMS Carpathia began her return to New York to deliver her cargo of survivors. Word of the Titanic disaster had quickly reached New York and the world. Many families who planned to meet the Titanic when she was scheduled to arrive at Pier 59 on Wednesday, April 17th, now awaited the RMS Carpathia at Pier 54. Many awaited word of their family and friends. Soon, the docks at Pier 54 and the offices at both the White Star Lines and at the Canard Lines were besieged with the concern at Pier 54, Edith and Percival White Jr. sought word of Richard and Percival Sr. When Carpathia had arrived in New York on April 18th, it was clear that Percival and Richard were not on board. But word had arrived that the cable-laying ship Mackie Bennett had departed Halifax in Nova Scotia on April 17th and was heading 800 miles out to locate any of Titanic's survivors or Titanic's dead. Due to rough weather, Mackie Bennett did not arrive at Titanic's last known location until April 21st. 300 bodies were eventually recovered. Only 56 were identified, and 116 were formally buried at sea. When the Mackie Bennett arrived back in Halifax on April 30th, there were 190 bodies aboard. Back in Maine, word had reached Brunswick and the community at Bowdoin College. Shock had set in. When Percival White's brother Zed 
had received word of the remains being transported to Nova Scotia, he quickly contacted Bowdoin College President William DeWitt Hyde, imploring him to locate someone responsible and send them to Nova Scotia. Hyde then turned to Bowdoin College medical student and senior Frank Smith, who hailed from Callis, Maine. Richard White's sister Mary had packed a bag and quickly departed with Smith. Within the day, Smith and Mary White had boarded a train in Brunswick and headed to Nova Scotia. When Mary and Smith had arrived, they discovered a makeshift morgue had been set up in a local hockey rink, where the ice cold of the venue would help to preserve bodies. Smith soon found Richard's body in a pine box. He was listed as remains number 169. Aside from his many personal effects, Richard's Bowdoin College fraternity pin had made Richard's identification a certainty. Many of the recovered victims of Titanic would not be identified nor claimed, and they would eventually be laid to rest in graves in Nova Scotia. But Richard White would be returned home. Frank Smith and Mary White had Richard's body prepared for transport by train. Smith then telegraphed President Hyde, who notified the family. Smith placed Richard's coffin on board the train, and then escorted his classmate back to Maine. Once on board Carpathia, Jack Thayer was reunited with his mother and their maid. Both had ridden out the sinking in the safety of a lifeboat, but it was soon clear. Jack's father John was lost to the sea. While Richard White's body was being transported home, Bowdoin College held a memorial service in the King Chapel on the Brunswick campus. On April 28th, just two weeks after the Titanic sank in the North Atlantic, administration, faculty, and staff at Bowdoin joined the student body to remember Richard White. Also in attendance were Richard's mother Edith and her son Percival Jr. By May 2nd, Frank Smith and Mary White had arrived in Portland. There they switched over to another train, then proceeded on to Winchenden in Massachusetts with Richard's body. A small family gathering committed Richard to his grave in the Riverside Cemetery next to a memorial stone for the father whose remains were never found. Had his bishop not recalled Father Francis Brown, the last known photograph of Percival White, taken on board the Titanic, might never have survived the sinking. When Jack Thayer had been safely borne to New York aboard the Carpathia, his story soon became told in the booklet that was published in 1912. Much of the heroism of Richard and Percival White in safely seeing Elizabeth Lyons and her daughter Mary placed safely aboard a lifeboat had been told in interviews, letters, and depositions. Although a ship's steward had directed the Lyons women to return to their cabin, it was Percival and Richard who took them out and saw them delivered safely into the lifeboat and it was the Lyons women who reported seeing father and son join hands and leap from the sinking ship into the ICC. The story of the sinking of the RMS Titanic is a behemoth-sized tale with many stories, details, and ironies. And Titanic remains some 110 years later as one of the most studied disasters in world history. And in that tale is the story of four men, all with strong main ties, who stood on the ill-fated deck of the RMS Titanic. And now the tale of Titanic, Richard and Percival White, and John and Jack Thayer, are forever remembered as one of our most legendary stories from Maine. <laughs> Yep.
happens on one Monday morning, just about one o'clock, when the great Titanic began to reel and rock, then the people began to cry, saying, Lord, we're going to die. It was sad when that great ship went down. It was sad when that great ship went down. It was sad when that great ship went down. There were husbands and wives, little children lost their lives. It was sad when that great ship went down. When they built the great Titanic, they said, what could they do? They said they built a ship that water could not go through. But God with his mighty hand showed the world it could not stand. It was sad when that great ship went down. It was sad when that great ship went down. It was sad when that great ship went down. There were husbands and wives, little children lost their lives. It was sad when that great ship went down. When they heard the signal ring, they were headed for the shore. The rich folks, they declared they wouldn't ride with the poor. So the sent the poor below, they were first and had to go. It was sad when that great ship went down. It was sad when that great ship went down. It was sad when that great ship went down. There were husbands and wives, little children lost their lives. It was sad when that great ship went down. When the people on the ship were a long way from home, with the people all around them didn't know that time had come. But death came riding by, sixteen hundred had to die. It was sad when that great ship went down. It was sad when that great ship went down. It was sad when that great ship went down. There were husbands and wives, little children lost their lives. It was sad when that great ship went down.